yes, hi Phil. So I will, I want to introduce Phil. So Phil will talk about, uh, let's say, the two topic of this day, APIs and sustainability. So uh, Phil, if you want to share some slide, you please do that. And, okay. uh, and nope. Andres. Hang about, got to set up some permissions for Chrome. I knew this was going to happen. I love your picture. I saw a picture of a, a cycle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> love cycle. Absolutely. I usually live on a bike. It's slightly harder to be a homeless bike nomad in lockdown times, but uh, that is usually the approach. For sure. Uh, nearly. Okay. Making progress. There we are. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Can you present it? Yeah. Does that work? Was... Yep. Perfect. Yay. You can okay. Um, so, hello, folks. I'm here to talk about sustainable APIs and API sustainability. Um, I think the last talk and some of the other stuff we've seen it, it has been a great deep dive. And I guess this is more of an overarching um, a picture of a whole bunch of stuff. But anyway, um, I'm Phil Sturgeon. I spoke at the last two API, API Days uh, Parises, so I might have seen some of you in person. Um, it's nice to be back here, at least in spirit. Um, I'm usually riding bikes around, helping people design APIs that aren't terrible and trying to save the planet because um, we're in trouble. Uh, so the API design stuff, I work for Stoplight, helping them build a whole bunch of tools, but don't need to talk about them right now. When I'm not, I, um, uh, I've started a reforestation charity. We work with a bunch of landowners all over the, uh, the UK, um, planting trees wherever they're not directly you know, using it for cows or whatever else. Um, and so this talk kind of combines my love of sustainable climate action and APIs. Seems great. Um, there's four main things we're going to cover. First is you should probably host your APIs somewhere sustainable. Um, the word sustainable is usually a bit fluffy, but I can quantify it a tad. Of the three main clouds, um, Google Cloud advertises themselves as the cleanest. And, and from what I can tell, they are. They are currently matching 100% of their electricity, which means, you know, burn a bunch of fossil fuels, then say, sorry, to the same, and, and you offset a certain amount, or you, you buy um, credits of, of renewable um, energy production being put back into the grid. Um, but they're looking to fully decarbonize their electric supply by 2030. So they are already throwing money at the situation, apologizing appropriately, and moving towards not needing to apologize quite so much in the future, which, okay. Uh, Microsoft Azure also kind of get in there. Uh, it's hard to tell whether they are matching or powered by 100% um, renewable. It's one of the two in 2025, so eh, okay. Uh, and then Amazon AWS basically are just like, we're going to do it sometime. And if you break, if you really Google around, you can kind of find that some of their centers are like 80% renewable energy. And again, don't know if matched or powered, but um, I'd recommend you know, if you're about to pick a cloud, then Google's probably a good one. Um, when you have the home for your infrastructure, when you know which data center it's gonna live, how can you use the least power and the cleanest power? Um, scaling to zero is a really important concept that's really often overlooked. I think people focus really hard on how quickly they can scale up to handle that big, you know, rush of traffic to people buy in there, whatever. Um, but people also, don't really think about how to how to scale back down again. Once you've got your budget of like we're going to spend you know five thousand or five million um, a, a month on on servers, that's how much we can afford. Uh, people just kind of think, well, that is the running base load, and sometimes our servers will barely get touched. Um, but that's okay; they need to be there for, for to be ready for something else. And um, the most ridiculous thing at my previous job, um, we were a co-working space, and people wouldn't come in on Thanksgiving. The whole company would try and take Thanksgiving off. So we'd just slide all of the scales up and be like, run as many server instances as possible, because if there's a memory leak, then we don't want to have to deal with it. And that's the most ludicrous mindset in the world of like, we know there's going to be less demand, so let's produce way more supply just so we don't have to do any hard work, because we probably did a crap job engineering in the first place. So um, don't do that. Scale down to zero when you don't need demand. Um, and something else you can do is, is you can actively seek uh, low carbon grid intensity. So um, basically, there's the idea that the grid intensity is how much uh, carbon emissions have been emitted 
in the production of the electricity being used. So if it's, you know, solar energy, very little depends if you're considering the entire life cycle analysis of, of that or the, just the running emissions. Um, but yes, in countries that use more renewables and more clean energy, uh, the grid intensity is much lower and th that can vary by region in America and can vary by state or area. Um, and in other countries, yeah, different, different bits of the country are different. So when you are scaling up, you can choose to, um, you can look at the um, uh, grid intensity of different areas and choose where you'd like to put that new pod. If you're using Kubernetes, that stuff is kind of pretty magic and, and a lot of it's handled for you. Um, there's a carbon aware Kubernetes article by Bill Johnson, wrote it for Microsoft. Very good article on this. It's still a bit theoretical. There's no like install this one piece of software and it just does it. But there are APIs you can use to find out what the grid intensity is in a certain region. Um, and then make those pods. And again, when you need to take down pods, you could have a look to see which is the highest carbon intensity. Um, there might be a difference in price, but if you know it, it, you don't necessarily want to go for the very cheapest CO2 um, if it's double or triple the price. That's hard to maybe get get past your bosses. Um, but you know, paying a little bit more to have half the amount seems like a pretty good thing to do. Um, different countries vary wildly in in their electricity mix. Um, so it also depends on the time. So it's not just like, oh, Portugal's good. Let's use Portugal or let's shove everything in Sweden. Like it depends on the, the time of day. And so this is often because like in Portugal, they get some stuff from Spain um, and, and, you know, that that's not as clean. But um, Estonia is is pretty bad all the time, but gets a lot worse um, at certain times of the day. They're basically bringing in loads of electricity from Russia and then adding coal on top. Um, and uh, Northern Ireland is, is pretty much equally bad all the time uh, when it comes to fossil fuels. So uh, different different countries, different days, different events can, can, can change uh, the intensity. So don't just look for the, the one place you should always put your servers. Um, next main bit is leverage green APIs. There's a bunch of really smart APIs out there to help with direct climate action and making your infrastructure and your APIs and your ecosystems more efficient. Um, one is electricity map. We were just looking at their iPhone app, but they also have an API and you can um, see a carbon intensity forecast um, and you can see um, like historical information. This one app does cost a little bit of money, um, but there is what time, which also is very similar, costs some money, um, and CO2 signal, which is kind of the free for students supposedly, but I guess anyone could have it for free. Um, and it will tell you how intense things are right now, but it won't help you with the forecast. Um, Forecasting is really cool for like working out when you should run your nightly jobs or maybe don't do them nightly, you know, um, Maybe if, if electricity is really green uh, at, at midday because you have a lot of solar wherever you are, instead of running these jobs at midnight, like people do just by default, you just type zero, 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 zero into cron. Maybe you do them at 12 o'clock when, when the electricity is, is cleanest. Another API I like a lot is, um, is ecology. Basically, uh, you can plant trees with a simple post request. I think that's pretty cool. Um, you can make a business account and uh, whenever you post with with your token, you just say, I want three trees and you can pass them your name um, and it will just plant those trees. Uh, they usually go in um, Madagascar or uh, I forgot what the other ones are. There's a few planting sites that used to just be Madagascar. They've got a few more. The actual planting is done with Eden Reforestation Projects who are, you know, time proven, fantastic charity for getting this done. Um, and if you don't want to have to do any work whatsoever to to make uh, to make contributions to climate action, Stripe have done a really good job. They researched a whole bunch of different projects they could use um, from direct carbon capture, vacuum it out of the air and shove it in rock, um, and uh, oh, Carbon Cure, which are a cement company who will blast CO two into the, the concrete as they're making it, trapping it away forever and making it stronger, right? They research these really clever companies who are doing really good things um, and, and they just take a little bit, they take 1% of your transaction and they just pass that off to those companies so they can do useful things with it. So this is using APIs under the hood, but you'd have to do any work really. Um, oh, there you go, Carbon Cure, Climeworks, two of, two of the good ones. 
Another really interesting API is air quality. Um, so you could use this um, for all sorts of tools. I mean, if I had a smart home, I'd want to make sure it shut the windows when air quality was getting really bad, right? Um, you can look up different areas where air quality is is struggling and you could make products that like warn people um, not to go outside when it's terrible. Most of us, most of the developed world would live in areas where by any definition, the air quality is dangerous and, and bad for us. So um, yeah, interesting information to have. You can also use this to like create reports and lobby local governments to do something. Uh, an interesting one, if you're building, um, if you're trying to work out what your carbon footprint might be for your company or personally, um, this is uh, an API from MyClimate. It's got um, carbon emission calculators for uh, cars and flights and cruise ships randomly and, um, and your company too. I think you can pass in a bunch of information like office space and number of employees and all that and it will it will tell you what your number is. Um, and if you don't want a DIY approach, this API-based carbon calculator from um, from Bloom, same people that make electricity map, is really good. Um, it looks, you can connect up Outlook uh, and your Uber uh, API and TripIt and Trainline and Wizzair and a bunch of these other things, a bunch of like flying and smart car driving things. If you have people driving around, um, you, you can hook all of this up and it will tell you overall uh, where your company's emissions are coming from. So it might not get as fine grained as some of the stuff we're looking at in the last talk of like, you know, this server is specifically doing this uh, and, and you'd have to do that work yourself. But um, for the kind of general uh, general case, if you just want to hook up some APIs and get some information on where all your CO2 is coming from, then that is pretty cool. The last bit and probably the more, I don't know, tricky bit, is that we can also design APIs, our APIs to be more sustainable. We can we can build them in a more clever way. Um, basically right now, the internet is about 3.7% of global greenhouse emissions by various sources, uh, and it's only set to double by 2025. So uh, that's roughly the same amount as flying. It's twice as much as the world's sewage handling. <laughs> it's, it's a really astonishing number um, going, you know, uh, need to fix it. Luckily, interestingly, the internet is 20% um, of the traffic goes through Akamai, and you may have seen this number a whole bunch of times, I'm sure it's been brought up here at this conference several times. Recent report, 83% um, of, no, ah, what is it? Yeah, 83% of the internet is like API stuff. Um, a lot of that's JSON. Um, XML seems to have kind of vanished, uh, but yeah, lots of lots of API activity happening through the Akamai network, which is like 15 to 20% of internet traffic. Um, and I reckon we could massively cut that down. Um, I, I see every single, every API ever <laughs> seems to just use all these kind of old network hacks. And I spent years trying to help people avoid them. Every time I do consulting for a company, people have got sparse field sets to trim down bits, uh, take a few fields out, compound documents, batch requests, no one's bothered doing caching because they haven't figured it out yet. And, you know, people are getting more and more on board with GraphQL, which is just standardizing and formalizing all of these ages old hacks into, into one kind of bundle. Um, and they are completely ignoring HTTP two and three, which obsolete the need for all of those hacks in the first place. Um, so sparse field sets, um, concept comes from a bunch of different places, OData, JSON API, GraphQL more recently. The idea is that you simply request which fields you would like. Um, the idea of that is that you are trimming the response size. Um, this is mostly incredibly useful if you have computed fields. So if you can avoid one specific field that's slow to compute on read, great. Just don't do that. Don't compute fields on read. And that's much less of an issue. There's usually a way around it. But um, basically by trimming bits, um, you can kind of speed things up. The use case would look like this. If you're getting a collection of turtles and you only want name and lifespan, that might take 200 milliseconds. If you want to get just the, the name, maybe that takes 192 milliseconds because you've shaved a little bit of size off. Um, this does make it smaller. It will give you a small improvement in your download speed. Every single client is probably requesting different combinations of fields because they're all optimizing for themselves. And that massively reduces cache hits, which means the application server still works very hard. Um, Caching, HTTP caching and REST in general is designed to work on network efficiency, not speed. So it's not about doing pointless things over and over again. It's about not doing pointless things. Um, so 
cash hit rate traffic, um, cash hit rates for API traffic were uh, higher in APIs than HTML traffic in this Akamai report, which is really interesting because I guess a lot of kind of bigger companies out there have figured it out, but so many people, uh, so many API developers, so many teams, like every company I go in to do consulting for just hasn't yet. Um, and so I think we can massively improve. We can knock some of this 3.7% of global greenhouse emissions off by de defining, designing and building um, uh, smarter APIs that reduce the load on the internet, right? Uh, client caching overall, uh, client caching and network caching can be paired quite nicely. Um, I've done a bunch of other talks. There's loads of content. Google, how do I do HTTP caching for APIs? And you'll find loads of stuff. Um, you can have a local cache and a shared proxy cache. These um, these proxy caches can be on the edge, so spread all around the world using hosted um, systems like Fastly, so that if the client makes a repeat request, they get it from their local cache. If they if they don't have it in their local cache or it's expired, it will go to the nearest edge server. So it's you know you're waiting less time for that data to be downloaded. And so even if you're waiting for technically more data, it's usually not coming as far and therefore is quicker. Um, and it's not that hard. People think it's 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 very difficult, but the most simple form of, of cache control is just putting a max age on something. We do this all the time with CSS and JavaScript and images, um, which can change, right? But uh, does it matter if you refresh and you get the latest thing? And if you don't refresh, you get an old thing. That seems fine. That's how most of the internet works. Um, and instead of kind of trying to trim um, the request down a little bit, you simply make a request and it takes a while, however long it takes. Um, and then you make the request again and it just magically is there immediately. Um, the magic comes from middlewares. Um, I, I don't mean to make it sound like it's incredibly simple. If you've looked at the, the specifications and tried rolling your own logic, it's hard. Don't try rolling your own logic. Don't build your own authentication. Don't build your own caching. Don't build your own anything. Just use a middleware. Um, and you can literally enable, this is a Ruby example. Um, you enable the middleware and you point it at the Rails cache and then it, it just works. You continue making get requests and whatever else if you send a post request. If, if you know it knows what to cache and what not to cache based on HTTP standards. Um, so people always say, yeah, but I can't cache that much data. This usually means that the API has been designed incredibly poorly and the mindset is a little bit wrong. Um, data is always stale. The second it hits the wire, like as soon as you finished making your request to the database, that could have changed. It could have changed before you turned it into JSON, before you put it over the wire, before the client got it. Um, so it, it's not about whether data is up to date or stale, it's how stale can it be before it's a problem. And, and people always seem to think like, no, it, it, it needs to be, it needs to be completely up to date. But even like stock trading platforms um, will have those prices be be limited, right? If you use Robinhood, it's like 15 minute old um, uh, numbers. So you don't even like stock systems don't need real time information. And, and most of us don't either. Um, we also can design our endpoints to be more cacheable in a bunch of ways. Uh, don't batch your calls, because that means that if a few of them are cacheable, but one of them isn't, well, you just can't cache anything. Um, don't use post or like put to get important information because that makes it hard to cache. Um, don't include requester specific information in the response body if you don't need to, because um, you're tainting a potentially cacheable response and don't return errors wrapped in 200 because then you can't use standard caching, network caching or client caching logic. Um, you are kind of forcing everyone to figure out like, oh, success, it, false, but 200, you know, it just gets really weird. All of this advice is on a Fastly article, uh, which is fantastic. Basically, don't make giant payloads with all sorts of mixed data. If A and B are cacheable, but they embed a C, then guess what? A and B aren't cacheable anymore. Um, a real example of how this might look uh, from the Fastly article again is if you are creating a booking system, you can book flights. Not so great for the planet, but ignore that. Um, a common thing to do is to try and reduce the number of overall requests, right? People are scared of making multiple requests because they're thinking in HTTP 1.1 terms where, you know, handshakes might took a, uh, might have took a while because um, people usually weren't using Keeper Live headers. They didn't know that exists, but um, HTTP 2 solves that. You can make a whole bunch of requests using the same connection, like multiplex, everything's great. So number of requests hasn't been a concern for several years. Um, but people keep building in this HTTP 1.1 mindset where they must, smallest number of gets possible. 
that means that you're making much larger payloads, which take the server a lot longer to go off and fetch all the data for, takes a lot longer to smush all of that into JSON, and takes a lot longer to force all that down the wire. And you're doing all of those steps every single time because you've mixed together so many different pieces of information. If any one of those fields in the JSON needs um, it is dynamic or is user specific or is likely to change a lot, then none of that information could have been cached. So what people do is if they'll say, okay, the booking specific information, don't have it on bookings slash like me, because then you can't cache it. If you have the booking reference, it's unique, um, then perfectly cacheable. This is why for a good API, you need to stop thinking of it as a collection of functions that you call whenever you want the answer and more like here is a document that lives on a URL and that URL can be cached just like in the browser. Um, so you have the information about the booking reference and that's there, that can be cacheable. Um, that can be cached for quite a long time. Um, and then you have the information about the flights and the seats available in that, which probably shouldn't be cached as long because seats might change quite a lot, um, but they can have different rules and that's the main point. So uh, the main thing there, it, the four categories <laughs> I could think of were host API semi-sustainable, be as efficient as possible as you can within that. Um, because just because your electricity is matched doesn't mean you should use loads of it. You want to, you know, if, if there's only a limited amount of solar power in the world, don't use it all on some crap while loop that should have you know, been finished. <laughs> um, leverage green APIs to, to, to do some of this good stuff um, and to, uh, to help with your green uh, infrastructure and offsetting your company and design the most sustainable APIs you possibly can so that you know people all over the world aren't wasting their battery and, and their internet <laughs> trying to use your service. Um, and that, I have no idea what's going on with times at the moment, but I might have some time for questions. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot, Phil, for your presentation. So <laughs> yes, if you can unshare your screen and so, Maybe we have some questions there we go. in the chat. Uh, let me check. Okay, so uh, I saw that you used an API called uh, Carbon CO2 or CO2 uh, Carbon. CO2, exactly. CO2 Signal, I think, is, is the one. CO2 signal. Yes. Yeah. Is it linked to uh, Electricity Map? Uh, yes, they. It's basically the free version of that same kind of data source. Yeah, they expose the current information as opposed to forecasting and historical. Ah, cool. Because we have we had tomorrow this morning uh, who presenting. Uh, oh, lovely. Yeah, they've yeah. got a bunch of really cool stuff. Bloom is made by them as well, so they've done a bunch yeah. of really interesting stuff. Yeah, interesting stuff. We have, we have another question for you from Brandon. Do you have an example of company who have integrated APIs into their sustainability effort? So do you have concrete example? Um, I mean, yeah, it, it depends on which thing you're asking about. A bunch of companies are using ecology. Um, some of them are even using the Shopify, um, uh, the Shopify plugin. Um, mm -hmm. And basically whenever someone buys stuff through Shopify, it will, you know, sponsor a couple of trees. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you who's doing what, but stripe.com slash climate, then uh, Substack and a bunch of other companies are using the 1% of your payment will go through that. So there's lots of those companies doing those sorts of things. And like I said, Microsoft are currently doing the research on on trying to have carbon aware Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, most companies are doing some of this, whether they're specifically using those APIs or not, it's hard to tell. Oh, uh, one good one I was thinking of, um, uh, electricity map, Google use that. Um, so they have very long running expensive processes that take a bunch of electricity, um, whether it's kind of doing a bunch of AI modeling or, or whatever it is. Um, Google will use electricity map to figure out when they should run those um, so that they're not doing it entirely on coal, but they're doing it on whatever hydro instead. So it could be four o'clock in the morning in one area and you know three in the afternoon, afternoon in another. Okay, thank you. So thank you for your time, uh, Phil, and for your presentation. Again, it was perfect. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Bye.